Hey everybody, welcome to the SeaTac Europe 2021 meeting. I'm Lisa Rodenberg and we're going to present some work that we've done. Uh, this is with Yan Lin and Stacy Capozzi and my colleague at Rutgers, Keith Cooper. We did some work on the source apportionment of perfluoroalkyl substances in Great Lakes fish. So for the two of you in the audience who don't know what PFAS are, they are per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. They're man-made chemicals that are used in things like Gore-Tex and non-stick uh, coatings and things like that. Um, and they uh, contain a lot of carbon fluorine bonds right here. So these are some of the, the most stable bonds in all of organic chemistry. And as a result, these have been called the forever chemicals. They just don't undergo a lot of chemistry. There is some reactions that happen here at the terminal functional group, but mostly they're just unreactive in the environment. And uh, so the old, the, the original sort of PFAS were PFOA and PFOS, perfluorooctanoic acid and perfluorooctanyl sulfate, um, I think. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Uh, then, th so those are being phased out now and they're being replaced with what they're calling these Gen X chemicals, which as you can see are structurally very, very similar, but just different enough uh, to uh, sort of evade regulations. So there's lots and lots of PFAS sources out there and the fingerprints are quite variable. You know, I do a lot of work with PCBs and the PCB formulations manufactured by Monsanto really have not changed, did not change over the entire period of manufacture, which makes fingerprinting easy. But for PFAS, the fingerprints are variable from manufacturer to manufacturer, from application to application, and they're changing rapidly because of some of these voluntary phase outs. For some of the PFAS compounds, particularly the PFOS, they can uh, be formed from precursors that are released into the environment and then react once they're in the environment to form things like PFOS, PFOS. Uh, so again, there's some alteration of that terminal functional group, especially in organisms, but mostly not much going on there. So the source apportionment of, of PFAS has been hampered. I've been wanting to do this for a long time, but I haven't been able to because I've been able, I've, I've had trouble finding data sets that have a long list of analytes, not just one or two, and where there's not too many non-detects. So that's that's what makes this difficult. Um, so this is just to, to show you all the different possible uses, non-stick coatings, firefighting phones, protective coatings, all kinds of things. And these are some pictures, you know, non-stick coatings. Here's some people putting out a fire with the firefighting foam. Gore-Tex is one of the non, non um, uh, won't wrinkle and stain resistant and, and uh, water resistant coatings that they put on clothing. So lots and lots of different uses. So oh, after wanting to do this kind of thing for a long time, I finally found a good data set uh, collected by the EPA here as part of their national coastal, coastal assessment. Uh, this data was collected in 2010, so it's getting a little old now, but they had 139 samples of fish. Many of those are composite samples. And so since this is fish, we always have to keep in mind that there might be these ADME processes occurring that will um, potentially affect the the fingerprints. <clears throat> so the PFAS were measured using HPLC with tandem quadrupole MS. Uh, there were 13 compounds measured. These 11 were included in our data analysis uh, because they were detected most of the time, but these two were not because they were usually below detection limit. <clears throat> so we originally found the data by looking through Storet, which is the EPA's online data portal. Uh, but Storet is missing some information, like it doesn't have surrogate recoveries. So when I find things in Storet, I usually then go to the, um, the original source of the data and ask them. And the EPA in this case was happy to provide me the data with the surrogate recoveries. So this data was analyzed using positive matrix factorization. Uh, PMF is a source apportionment tool. It's, it's similar to principal components analysis. Both PCA and PMF use this same basic equation where X here is your data matrix. It's all your, it's 139 samples times 11 analytes. And this, the program seeks to describe this as a linear combination of a small number of sources. Each of those sources has a fingerprint F and then that's multiplied by the abundance or concentration of that fingerprint in every single sample. And then there's a leftover here E, that's the residue, that's what you're trying to minimize. You're trying to minimize the amount of the variability in the data that is not explained by the model. So the user has to decide what is the correct or optimal number of factors or sources. And that's a, kind of a long story, but there's, there's a couple different types of PMF software out there. I have been using PMF2. 
it's it's a thousand dollars for for a license but it's good for a lifetime and it's a dos based program which is a problem because new versions of windows don't come with dos so i'm running a windows 7 pc inside my regular pc um, the epa licensed this and put out a version called epa pmf 5.0 this is free if you google it it'll come right up you should you can download it it's windows based but in my experience, it just doesn't work as well as PMF2. And as far as I know, it is no longer supported by the EPA. It would be great if someone would write a PMF routine for R or Python. I, I don't have the expertise to do that. But last semester, I taught a class about uh, data management, data mining, and I made a couple of videos about PMF. And I put them on YouTube, and they now have over 1,300 views. So that tells you that there's a lot of people out there that want to use this technique. And it would be great if we could have some support, especially since the EPA is no longer supporting it. So the PMF results, first you get your F matrix. So this is the F matrix. These are the fingerprints. And we determined that five was the optimal number of fingerprints that would adequately describe our data. Finger factor number one here explains 72% of all the mass of the PFAS in our data set. And it is totally dominated by PFOS. Factor number two here is 13% of the mass. And these, these on the x-axis are the compounds arranged in increasing order of molecular weight. So here's the butyl acid and here's the dodeca. So these have the high chain, high, uh, long chain um, acids, perfluoroacids. Perfluoro and so we think because of that, that this is related to either textiles or metal plating or maybe both. This is one of the real challenges about PMF is that, or excuse me, about PFAS that it's it's difficult to know what the sources are because they're so variable you know we're really not sure uh then factor three here is seven percent of all the mass we think because of the preponderance of the pfna the, the nona acid here that it's related to fluoropolymer manufacturing factor four is only five percent of the mass and it has pfhxs in it which we think is a marker for these firefighting foams the aqueous film forming foams or AFFFs. Factor five is 4% of the mass. It has PFOS and PFOSA in it. That's, I can't, I can't pronounce it. P perfluorooctanoic sulfonamide, I believe is correct for PFOSA, PFOSA. Uh, and so we think that this represents the biotransformation where PFOSA is biotransformed into PFOS. So keep in mind that, you know, we do have the ADME processes occurring here. So the fingerprints that we see in the fish won't be exactly the same as the fingerprints that you might find in the sediment or the phytoplankton or the water column that they're being exposed to. So just words of the wise. So that's the F matrix. The G matrix is the concentration of each of those five factors in every sample. And so once we have that and all of our samples are geotagged, so we can do lovely things like make maps. So here's a map of the first factor, which is the PFOS. And you can see how the concentrations are low here on the western edge of the Great Lakes. But by the time you get to the west, the eastern end of Lake Ontario, the concentrations are quite high. And there seems to be a kind of a gradual steady increase in PFOS concentrations. We think that this is either a couple of reasons that this could be occurring. One is that um, PFOS does is one of the, the PFAS that can come from precursors. And over here, is Minneapolis and St. Paul, where 3M has their many of their manufacturing facilities. It's possible, possible that there is a mission of precursors over here, and then they get picked up by the prevailing winds and, and taken uh, eastward. And, and during their atmospheric transport, they're reacting to form PFOS. This takes time. It takes a day or so. And in that time, the, the wind has blown maybe 500 kilometers or so. And so that's why you get the highest concentrations over here and you don't get as much over here. Uh, that's one possible reason. The other thing we think could be occurring here is that this area of high concentration represents P PFOS that was maybe released to the environment 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, and since PFOS is being phased out, this slug of high concentration is moving its way out of the Great Lakes and behind it is coming lower concentrations as a result of the phase out. I'm going to show you one more map. This is for those those AFFFs. Um, obviously, first of all, completely different spatial variations in concentration. Highest concentration happening over here. Uh, and right here is former Wurtsmith Air Force Base. It's a decommissioned Air Force Base with very well-known problems of PFAS contamination due to the use of these firefighting foams uh, in aviation. 
So we were we plotted the the abundance of this factor four versus the locations of things like military bases here, and also versus civilian uh, aviation airports. And there does seem to be a correlation between the presence of aviation and particularly military aviation and the high uh, concentrations of factor four, which is another reason why we think it's related to these firefighting columns. So we can do this kind of uh, spatial analysis for all five of those factors. Here's all of the data really in one figure. Each lake, uh, the, the points are, are uh, oriented from, from west to east within each lake. And you can see how in Lake Superior, these other sources of PFAS are fairly important. But by the time you get to Lake Ontario, the vast majority is just PFOS. Um, and because we can't, because we have everything geotagged, we can do fun things like do correlations with land use here. So for example, factor one, which is the PFOS, is negatively correlated with forest areas, but positively correlated with cropland, which could have something to do with the use of precursors or PFAS in agriculture. So we can, we can start to look at some of these correlations. So in conclusion, we are starting to generate PFAS data sets that are big enough and have enough uh, detections to do some serious data mining. Our PMF analysis of this data set suggests that the precursors are an important source of PFAS. There is some ADME of PFAS occurring in the fish, uh, and the AFFFs are important sources of PFAS to the Great Lakes environment. So this has been submitted to the Journal of Environmental Pollution, and we want to thank Harry McCarty and Leanne Stahl at the UP US EPA for providing the data and Lee Lin for uh, helping us with those land use correlations. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. My, my understanding is there's going to be a chat function. I'll be able to do that. So I look forward to hearing from you. Any questions about our work?